So we'll see if I can get anywhere through my message, but let's pray and we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your love for us. We thank you for um, the work that Team Workers does. We thank you for the locals down there who are praying and, and waiting and desiring for us to go down and help them. And Father, we just pray that everything would uh, come to fruition. And Father, for uh, just help me to speak clearly and concisely and your message will come through. <clears throat> Back in the spring, I was asked to speak on Mother's Day. And so I was rereading a bunch of passages in the Bible about mothers. And I was going through the story of Sarah and Hagar, and I will use Sarah and Abraham rather than, than their old names, just because they're more familiar to us. Um, but during the story of Sarah and Hagar, I really got quite struck with the story and and struck with what, what we miss about Hagar in this picture. And so I think when I started my sermon the last time in, in uh, Barry, they thought I was going to speak about Sarah, but I went straight to Hagar. So we're going to talk a little bit about Hagar this morning and then look at uh, where they come up in the New Testament or where she comes up in the New Testament. Pretty familiar story. We all know uh, Sarah was old. She couldn't get pregnant. So as it was in the time, she took her slave and gave it to Abraham to produce an heir. Uh, Hagar um, is Egyptian, historically uh, ethnic Egyptian, and she was given as a gift, they believe, to Sarah from the Egyptian Pharaoh at the time, and she was just a piece of property. She was brought back uh, for, for whatever Sarah needed her for. Um, and so this idea of giving her over to, uh, to Abraham is not unusual. Um, and of course, we know Hagar gets pregnant. And what does Sarah do? She gets jealous. What does she do next? She blames her husband. It's your fault. You know, why, why did this happen? And uh, Abraham, in I'm not saying a typical male way, but he says, no, no, it's not my fault. She's yours. You deal with it. You deal with the problem. And so Sarah, uh, Sarah says, go, leave, go to the desert, don't care where you go, but you can no longer stay here. So she wanders off in the desert to die. And, uh, and as she goes out in the desert, she has this extraordinary, really extraordinary encounter with God, or a messenger from God, an angel. And he tells her probably not what she wanted to hear, but he says, go back and listen to your master. Listen to what Sarah has to say. And, uh, and then he says in Genesis 16, 11, God commanded, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your ministry, your misery. Uh, God had heard the suffering of Sarah, this poor slave girl. And at the same time, he's making promises to Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child and, and be a father of a great nation. Um, but he heard, he heard this slave girl sitting out in the desert by herself. And sometimes I can feel pretty insignificant in a big world, and this gives me comfort. And he gives her a name that would remind her constantly that God hears her. And she does something that happens for the very first time in the Bible. She gives God a name. And she says, uh, she calls him El Rui Ra'a, the God who seeing sees. Uh, verse 13 says she gave this this name to the Lord who spoke to her you are the Lord who sees me for she said I have now seen the one who sees me how powerful a statement that is I have now seen the one who sees me here's this insignificant slave girl sent off into the desert and God sends her a message saying don't worry, I hear you, I see you. And her response was, I can now say that I have seen the God who sees me. Um, it's a powerful message for those who don't feel seen. I can tell you, I meet many people in the church who feel that they are not seen. I talked to a kid in my Iwana program and, and uh, she's an extraordinary young woman. And yet in her mind, She's invisible. Nobody sees her. Nobody cares about her. 
And I had to read these verses to her and remind her that God sees her and that she is seen. The story plays out in history. Ishmael becomes the father of all Arab people and Isaac becomes the father of the Jewish nation. And that in itself is an interesting story. But then we go to the book of Galatians and this whole story comes up again in kind of a strange way. If we look at, at Galatians, um, it's in central Turkey. I did a bus ride through central Turkey and I've been to Ephesus and past Colossae and Laodicea and I went up to Smyrna. Um, if you want a biblical sort of New Testament history, very cheaply, then take a drive through Turkey because it's a very cheap place to go. And it's very historically uh, Christian, even though it's a Muslim country today. Uh, the Galatians were Celtic Gauls. They came from uh, the mainland part of Europe and they immigrated over to the Turkey region. Uh, they were very prominent in the third and fourth century BC. And uh, by the time we have the letter written, they had really fallen both in population and out of favor. So they're, they weren't as prominent, the Roman Empire had taken over. Um, but there's the, there were these core group of Gauls who lived in, in uh, Galatia. The letter was written to the churches. We don't know how many churches there were uh, or their locations today, but we do know that they were, uh, they were started by Paul in one of his mission journeys. And into that church at Galatia, you have some Jewish believers coming in. And so they walk in and they say, well, it's not good enough for you just to be a Christian. You have to be a Jewish Christian. You have to start following the Jewish laws. Um, and when Paul hears this, I can just see him, you know, give your heads a shake, people. Uh, and he starts the letter out pretty strongly. So in chapter one of Galatia, Gal Galatians, Galatia. Verse six, it says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God, or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I can hear Paul saying, what are you people thinking? Uh, I'm astonished, he says. You accepted a gospel of grace and you want to go back to a gospel of law. Um, he makes a strong statement. And in case you don't get the point, he repeats the whole thing over again. He says, if anyone, including an angel, preaches a gospel other than the gospel of Christ, then let him be cursed by God. The gospel we all understand. The gospel is a pretty simple concept. Jesus died for our sins. He was raised again, and it's by his work and our faith that we have eternity with Christ. It's not complicated. It's not a lot of stuff to do. It's pretty simple, and we all understand it. Paul says there's no need for a Gentile to become a Jew in order to have faith. In fact, he makes it quite clear. You should not be a Jew. Um, in fact, Martin Luther, when he read the book of Galatians, came up with this concept of solo fide, uh, faith alone. That when he read Galatians, he realized that at the time, the Catholic Church, they weren't trying to make them Jews, but they were trying to make them follow so many rules and so many laws that it was blinding them to the real uh, concept of faith. And so Martin Luther in reading Galatians said, no, faith alone, it is only faith in Christ that saves. And then we get to this illustration in chapter four. So it says, uh, tell me who desires to be under law? Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave, one by a free woman. 
But the son of the slave is born according to the flesh, the son of the free woman through promise. Now, this is an allegory. These women are two covenants, one from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is her mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in travail. For the children of the desolate one are many more than the children of her that is married. It's kind of interesting that comment. The, the children of the desolate one are many more than the children of, of her that is married. Do you know how many Jews there are in the world today? I won't make you guess, but there's about 13, about 15.2 million Jews in the world. There are 313 million Arabs. Now, why? Clear that God's promise or God's uh, proclamations come true. The children of Hagar are going to be much more abundant than the children of Sarah. There are 313 million Arabs and only 15 million Jews. Why he did that, I don't know, but that's what he did. If you go on in the verses, now we brethren like Isaac are children of promise. But at the time, he who was born according to the flesh, flesh persecute him was born according to the spirit. So it is now, uh, so it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave and her son, for the son of the slave shall not inherit but the son of the free woman. So brethren, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. This allegory uh, of Sarah and Hagar is written to persuade the Galatians and for us not to get caught into this idea of, of these Judaizers, uh, people who wanted to encompass people with religious laws that would take away from their faith. It was a story that clearly the Gentiles must have understood or he wouldn't have used it, and clearly uh, the Jews would have understood. But it's an unusual story. Hagar, she represents, she represents Gentiles. Uh, who is a Gentile represents the Jewish nation living under the law. Sarah, who is a Jew, represents the Gentiles living under grace. So he's completely, you know, changed those two in this metaphor and who they are and what they do. Couldn't have been easy listening to the Jews. Uh, they were, they, were quite confident that they were free and you know they weren't like the gentiles they were different they were god's chosen people and yet here he's saying no jews you the one you're the ones that are like hagar you're the ones that are caught up in the law and it's the gentiles who are free must have been difficult for them to, to listen to he says hagar represents the law uh, the ten commands were given on mount sinai which he talks about her children were born of flesh, uh, they were born to slavery, and it's a bit confusing. Uh, the mother of all Arabs is representing the Jewish nation here. She was a slave because of her birth, uh, and Ishmael was the result of Sarah and Abraham not waiting for the supernatural intervention of God. Um, and they were enslaved to the law. He speaks of Sarah. In this case, Sarah represents um, He says Christians are born in freedom and and should be free. And so Sarah, as a Jew, is representing the Gentiles here and Christendom today. And I'm not going to get anywhere near done, so I'm just throwing some notes out as I'm going along in case you're wondering why I'm stammering a little bit. Um, and then he comes down to this concept about being free. And I, and I asked this in my church when I spoke uh, a number of months ago, and I said to them, what is the definition of freedom? And so if you go to the dictionary and you look up the definition of freedom, it says the power or right to act or to speak or to think 
as one wants without any hindrance or restraint. Did you get that definition? Now I will ask you the question, so nobody needs to respond. Is that, does that definition make sense? The power or the right to act, to speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Since you're not cooperating, I'm going to answer for you. It doesn't make any sense at all. Because think about this. If you got to do whatever you wanted, things would not work out very well. I may want to go over and poke Dave in the eye. He won't like it, and he might hit me back, and then I won't like it. What we wanted to do was not beneficial for either one of us. Um, my wife had, had bought some butter tarts and we'd taken them to the cottage. And she said, we have some guests coming up on the weekend, so I'm going to put these in the freezer. Well, I happened to open the freezer one day. What did I want? I wanted a butter tart, so I took one. Well, I think some of my kids had the same want. And they took some butter tarts. And our guest came up on the weekend, and guess what we didn't have for our guest? Butter tarts. So doing the things that you want is not always beneficial. Uh, so the definition that I heard, which I thought was interesting, is the idea of what you can do or think that would make you happy for eternity. So freedom is what you can do or think that will make you happy for eternity. And if you take that definition of it, it's a completely different definition and makes you think of freedom in a completely different way. I'm throwing out a couple of pages. Freedom is not sort of the opportunity, the ability to do whatever you want. Um, because we know that that often cause, causes conflicting goals. The basic tendency of Christianity is to give up the things we want and to do the things that Christ wants us to do. Those wants uh, are fleshly wants, often. And Christ really wants to talk about spiritual things not temporal things, not things of this world. Um, in this passage, he makes it clear. Jews have become slaves to worldly things, to rules, and not following the promises of God. The promise of God of salvation is freedom and heirs for eternity with Christ. We don't ignore rules. Um, I'm an accountant. I spent my life following a lot of rules. Uh, and I... I believe that we should obey rules. Those rules were earthly rules and temporal rules. What we're talking about here is issues of faith. How we deal with people within uh, the local community, how we deal with people in the church. Um, in fact, I would say that there's only one thing in this world that we should worry about, because there is only one thing in this world that is eternal, and that is people. Everything else doesn't matter. C.S. Lewis says, uh, there are no ordinary people. There are no mere mortals. Nations, cultures, art, civilization, these are mortal. The things of this world are mortal. They're earthly. Uh, but our life, compared to our lives, all of those earthly things, he says, are but a gnat, like a little fly. The Roman Empire was started in 825 or 625 BC. It went to 476 uh, AD. So it was 1,100 years the Roman Empire was in power. I've been to Rome. I've been to places in Turkey and places in England where the Roman Empire is still visible and you can see all of their works. And they built incredible, incredible architectural things. But if you take 1,100 years and you add it to eternity, it's still eternity. So what the Roman Empire uh, accomplished in 1,100 years 
compared to the life of a believer, is nothing. It's meaningless. And this is what, what Lewis was trying to communicate. When you meet somebody, it doesn't matter who it is, and it doesn't matter what shape they're in or what circumstance they're in, they are essentially an eternal being. Whether eternity in heaven or eternity in hell is their choice, but they're an eternal being. And so when you meet somebody, that is the only thing that you have on earth that you can have an impact of eternity on. And so you, when you think about that, all of the other stuff that goes on, all of the rules and regulations and all of the stuff that we make up is really not all important. It's how you interact with human beings that God is really calling you to. When I started looking at that concept and thinking about the only thing I can really um, impact are other human beings that impact eternally, I had to stop and take a look at my own life. Uh, how am I treating those things that are eternal? How am I treating my brothers and sisters in the church? How am I treating my family? How am I treating my neighbors? How am I treating the people that I, that I interact with every day? You know, the waitress in the restaurant or the clerk at the store. Um, my own faith and the humans that God has put in my life are the only things that are important. And it's not necessarily an easy search, I can tell you that. I definitely found a few areas in my life that are lacking, uh, and I know I have to do something about it. I'm an introvert. I don't necessarily like people, I will admit that. I love people, but if there's any introverts in this, in this room, you will understand this. Sometimes people suck the life out of you. Um, and as an introvert, you, you, don't, you don't always interact well with people. Uh, but I have learned, hopefully, that I have to. And, uh, you know, we were driving back from Bruce Mines to Barrie and, and uh, I have a friend in Sudbury and, and I hadn't seen her in a while. And, and I thought, I don't have time. I got to be back. I'm teaching Iwana that night. And, uh, and I'm on a schedule, and if I stop there, mm, it's going to really crunch me for time. And I was going through all the excuses, all the things that I wanted to do in my head. And I could just feel God pushing me. No, you need to stop and visit her. You need to stop and see her family. You need to stop and talk to her kids. And so I called her up. You home? Yep. Come on over. So I dropped in, and we spent an hour or two visiting with her and drove on. She sends me a text text your stop made my whole month not my day not my hour not my week but it made a whole month I didn't want to stop I didn't have time I didn't really have the inclination I didn't have the desire but yet I think God was pushing me for someone that needed a conversation someone that needed some encouragement um, and that's really what's important in this whole picture when you look at Sarah and Hagar this understanding of Hagar was the unseen, unworthy, unworthwhile person. And yet God looks down and says to her, no, no, I hear you and I see you and I always will. And if you follow the rest of the story, it's quite interesting what happens because the whole process repeats itself when she leaves with her son into the desert and her son's dying. Um, and so, my encouragement to you is to go out and look for those people that don't feel seen or heard and see them and hear them. You know, stop and take a minute and say, hey, what's going on in your life? And sometimes they'll say, mm, nothing. Um, I'm going to pick on my nephew and my great nephew are here. My great nephew, Bo, in the fancy rodeo jacket, you may want to ask him about his fancy rodeo jacket after. He is the quietest kid I know, and he doesn't talk a lot. But sometimes you have to poke him and say, hey, what's going on? And he'll say, nothing. But you need to make sure that he knows that he's seen and he's heard, because that's what God does to people. Um, and this idea of let's impact things that are eternal. Let's impact the people in our lives. And whether that's within the church or outside the church, 
whether Christians or non-Christians, they are all eternal beings. And that is the only thing that you can touch in this world that has an eternal impact. And so we should do that. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for uh, your goodness to us. We thank you for making us individual human beings with different thoughts and different ideas, uh, different practices. And yet, Lord, you have allowed us, even in this local church, to come together and uh, to worship, to fellowship, and, Father, to glorify you. And that is really what we want to do. So pray that we, as we go out this week, that we would uh, see and we would hear. We wouldn't worry about all of the stuff that's going on around us. And we would really worry about how we can impact those things that you've created that are eternal. And that really is only the people that we see. Thank you for this church here, for their uh, faithfulness with team workers and with uh, Lighthaven. And Father, we pray uh, as the teams are, are built for this year, uh, next year that we would see uh, full teams we be able to accomplish all the work we need to get done and father that we would see lives change both both by those that team workers and by the people that we're working for i thank you for your blessings and, and we're grateful for what you have given us we pray in your son's name amen